In Israel, there is a wall. And this wall is called the Western Wall. The reason why it's called the Western Wall is because it sits on the west side of the Temple Mount there in Jerusalem. Now, it is believed, this wall, it is believed to be the only thing left standing, the only thing that remains of the temple, the second of Solomon's temple that we just finished reading about in the book of Ezra. It is said that this is the only thing that remains, it is the only thing that is left standing after the second time it has been destroyed. Now, some people would argue that. Some people would say, no, I don't believe this wall has anything to do with the temple because, after all, Jesus, when he predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, he said no stone would be left on another. Okay? That's what he said. And so you have those who believe this wall called the Western Wall has nothing to do with the temple because God said not one stone would be left on another. But the other side of the argument would say this, well, no, this wall was actually an extension of the temple done by Herod the Great. Herod the Great actually built an extension, an extension of the wall, and so therefore that's why this wall can still remain even though Jesus said no stone would be left on another. But in any rate, in A.D. 70, A.D. 70, Jerusalem and the temple, God's house, was once again destroyed. Again, we just finished reading about the first time it was destroyed in the book of Ezra. With Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, he comes in. Uh, God allows chastisement or judgment to come upon his people for their wickedness, for their rebellion, for their sin. And so Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, they come in and they defeat Israel, they destroy Jerusalem, and they tear down the temple, the gates, and the walls, okay? The last series that we were on talked about them being restored, about them be, being re- remaining and returning and rebuilding the city and the temple as well. But this is another reason why you ought to believe in God and God's Word, okay? Because Israel was destroyed again, but yet remains today, ought to be enough evidence that there is a God who's in full control and you can believe in his word. Why? Because there has never been any other people any at any other time that where you have a nation who has been defeated, who has been scattered all over the face of the world for years, but yet still it be prophesied years before it would happen that these same people who were defeated and scattered all over the face of the earth would one day come back to rebuild, would one day come back to be restored. And that has happened not only once, but twice with Israel. The first time it happened in the book of Ezra, we just finished reading it. The second time was in A.D. 70. A.D. 70, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed once again, this time by Rome. But yet today, Jerusalem still exists and Israel is still a nation. Now, how do you explain that? Okay? How do you explain that in 1967, Israel once again becomes a nation and they pick up where they left off, not skipping a beat, talking the same language, having the same customs, doing the exact same thing before they were defeated and scattered. How do you explain that but God? So because Israel still exists today, because they are a nation today after being destroyed and scattered, that ought to be enough information for you, enough proof that God is real and his word is true. Because he predicted, he prophesied that it will be exactly as it has been brought about. And so this is where we find ourselves now. Although today Israel has returned as a nation, okay? Israel has returned as a nation. They are not yet fully restored, okay? Israel is not yet fully restored. And the way that we know Israel is not yet fully restored is because not only are they not the sole inhabitants of Jerusalem, okay? You have Palestine there as well. That's what the, the war, the fighting is all about. But you know they are not restored because they have no temple. 
<laughs> they have no temple. They have no temple to go and worship their God. They have no temple to go and sacrifice their God. They have no outer court and inner court and holy of holies. They don't have that. And so because not only do they have other inhabitants with them, they don't have the temple which lets us know, although they have come back to be a nation once again, they have yet to be fully restored. They don't have the temple. It's coming. And perhaps we will get to that series at a later time. But for right now, all they have is this wall. That's all they have. All they have is the western wall, what they believe is the only remnant of the temple that was destroyed. That is all that they have. And so this wall that's in Israel, that's in Jerusalem, not only is it called the western wall, it is also called the wailing wall. Okay? It is also known as the Wailing Wall. And the reason why it's called the Wailing Wall is because all day, every day, you have Jews who are coming to this wall to wail. <laughs> you are co they are coming to this wall to lament, to beseech their God, to pray for full restoration, for their God to show up, to kick out the inhabitants that occupy this place with them, to restore Israel, that they may be allowed to rebuild Solomon's temple again. That is what they are praying for. And so every day, all day, they come to this wall to wail about their predicament. So it's called the Western Wall because it's on the west side, but it is also called the Wailing Wall because they go to this wall to wail. But just like the Jews today wail at the wall, there was a time when Israel wailed for the wall. Okay? Say it again. Just like today you have the Jews, Israel, wailing at the wall, there was a time in history when you had Israel, the Jews, wailing for the wall. Wailing for the wall, and it is at this point in our timeline where we find ourselves. You see, even though the remnant remained and was released and returned and rebuilt the city and the temple, their restoration isn't complete until they rebuild the wall. <laughs> their, their, their restoration cannot be complete until they also rebuild the wall surrounding Jerusalem, the wall surrounding the temple. And so for the next series, for our next series, we're going to take a journey. We're going to go through the journey of the Jews rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. We're going to go through the journey of the Jews, Israel, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And, of course, we're going to go through the book of Nehemiah. And so we're going to entitle this particular message as well as this series we're going to be in for the next several weeks, Wailing for the Wall. Wailing for the Wall. Now, one little background on this. Nehemiah is the continuation of the book of Ezra. Okay. We just finished Ezra, we're going into Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the continuation of the book of Ezra. It is believed to be one book that they broke into two. And while Ezra focused on the rebuilding of the temple, Nehemiah focuses on rebuilding the wall. Okay. Now, the question that the Lord has for us this morning to ponder and to consider even for ourselves is this. What is the purpose or the significance of, for the wall. What is the purpose or the significance of the wall? Why did Israel feel that they wouldn't be complete, that they wouldn't be fully restored without rebuilding the wall? I mean, they had the city, they're in Jerusalem, they had the temple that was rebuilt. Why did they feel it necessary to rebuild the wall that surrounded the city? Well, there are both practical as well as symbolic reasons for the wall. And today what I want to simply do is give you three reasons. Give you three purposes or three reasons why Israel at this time wailed for the wall. Okay? 
Number one, if you are taking notes, one of the purposes of a wall, a wall partitions par property. Okay? A wall partitions property. In Exodus 23, now there are several scriptures on this, but we don't have time to go through all of them, so let me just give you a couple. One in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. If you go to the book of Exodus 23, in Exodus 23, starting in verse 31, this is God speaking to his people. Notice what he says. He says, And I will set your bounds, or your boundaries, from the Red Sea to the Sea Philistia, and from the desert to the river, that is the river Euphrates. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. God comes to his people before they enter the promised land, and he says, I am going to drive out the inhabitants from that land. I'm going to drive them out, and I'm going to bring you in. And when I do that, I am then going to establish your borders. I'm going to establish your boundaries. You're going to have from the Red Sea to the Sea Felicia. You're going to have from the desert to the river. I'm going to establish your borders to separate you from them. Now, this is why there should not be at this present time a double occupancy in Jerusalem. <laughs> there should not be a double occupancy again uh, with the uh, Israelis and the Palestinians. Why? Because it is clear in Scripture whom the land belongs to. God said, I'm giving you this land. <laughs> And so unless God has changed his mind, the land belongs to Israel. And that's why we support Israel, okay? <laughs> but here he makes it clear, I am going to establish boundaries. I'm going to establish borders. I'm going to establish a wall that will partition my property. You belong to me. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You belong to me. So I'm going to establish borders. I'm going to establish a boundary to separate or to partition my property. He also says in the book of Acts, so you will know this is not just dealing with Israel or not just in the Old Testament. If you go to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 26, notice what he says here. He says, and he, speaking of God, has made from one blood, Adam and Eve, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. So everybody has come from the same parents, okay? Everybody's come from the same blood. But even though everybody has come from the same blood, notice what he says next. And has determined their pre-appointed times, and watch this, and the boundaries of their dwellings. God has determined the boundaries of their dwellings. So every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every kindred, all people, the Bible says, even though you've come from the same blood, I have determined the boundaries of your dwellings. Now, why would God do that? Why would God do that? Why couldn't we just sing, this land is your land, this land is my land to everybody? Why couldn't we do that? <laughs> well, God tells us why he has done this, why he has uh, uh, pre-appointed the boundaries for our dwellings. He says, so that they should seek who? The Lord. So that they should seek the Lord, in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. In other words, translation, America is not the hope of every nation. Jesus Christ is the hope of every nation. <laughs> he is the answer to every nation. 
God is not saying, no, I want you to grope for America. I want you to seek America. I want you to find America. He said, no, no, I want you to seek me. And if you seek me, you won't have to worry about America. You won't need America because I will bless you as I have done America. He says, the reason why I have established boundaries is so that you might seek me to bless you, to prosper you, to benefit you. I don't want you to seek another people or another nation to be your God and replace me. I want you to seek me. So God says, even though we've all come from the same people, same family, same blood, he is still predetermined our boundaries, our borders, and our dwelling places. So the walls that God has established, we call borders, has been done simply to partition property. To partition property. And we we even see this in our own lives. I I venture to say now one person in here uh, doesn't have a fence around their property, right? Everybody here has got a fence around your property. What, What is that fence for? What is the purpose of that fence? It is to partition your property. To show where your property is and your neighbor's property begins. The same exact reason. And you can look over the fence and see how nice your neighbor has it. (laughs) But you have no permission to go into that neighborhood. Why? Because of the fence that is there. So the purpose of the wall, number one, is to partition property. Number two, secondly, if you're taking notes. The second purpose of a wall is simply this. A wall not only partitions property, it also preserves property. (laughs) A wall preserves property. In other words, it keeps what's in from getting out. (laughs) The purpose of a wall is to preserve what's in the wall. It keeps in what's in from getting out. Now, besides a prison... (laughs) Besides a prison, why would you want to keep what's in from getting out? Why would you want to do that? Well, because you know what's outside the wall is danger. Okay? (laughs) There is danger on the outside of the wall. There is danger beyond the walls. And so what you want are walls to keep, to preserve what is in the wall. And so what you'll have, you'll have shepherds who will shepherd the sheep. They will lead the sheep outside during the day. But at night, they will bring the sheep inside the wall. We call it a sheep pen, right? Why do they do that? (laughs) Because they don't want to lose their property. They don't want a sheep to wander off and to get lost or to get eaten by a wolf or whatever. So what they will do is they will bring the sheep inside the wall. They will bring the sheep inside a pen in order to preserve their property. And it is the same way again with God. You remember the 10th plague when when his people are in Israel or in in Egypt and uh, he's going to send the 10th plague, the plague of death, going to wipe out the firstborn of everybody. What does he tell them? He says, make sure you stay on this side of the wall. (laughs) Stay inside of this wall because outside the wall there's death, there's destruction. You don't want to go outside. What you want to do is stay inside, under the blood, okay? Because I want to preserve what is within. Same thing that the spies told uh, Rahab. The spies go to Rahab and say, Rahab, because you have preserved us, guess what? We will preserve you. But what we are telling you to do is make sure you stay inside the wall. (laughs) Stay inside the wall of your house because if you go outside, if you venture outside, we are not responsible for what happens to you. Because the purpose of a wall is not only to partition property, it is also to preserve property. So it is to partition, it is to preserve, and then the last purpose of the wall is to protect property. To protect property. So like preserving keeps in what's in from going out, protecting keeps what's out from coming in. (laughs) <laughs> okay. <laughs> While preserving keeps what's in from going out where there's danger, protecting deals with keeping what's out from coming in. This is the other reason or purpose for the wall. Go with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, starting in verse 1, these are the words of Jesus. Notice what he says about this. 
He says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, <laughs> but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. You know, one of the biggest topics of controversy or contention in this last election was immigration, right? Immigration was a big topic. It was a place of contention, place of controversy, and specifically the idea of building a what? A wall. <laughs> and that was a place of contention for, for, for this particular election. And the reason why it was uh, contentious and, and controversial because many believe it was racially motivated or at least racially insensitive because you are uh, dealing with a certain group of people. And this is what you're talking about. But on one hand, on one hand, we all want to establish our borders. We all want to keep what we have in and keep it safe. And we all want the enemy out. Everybody wants that. Nobody would argue that. But on the other hand, the reason why it's controversial is because on the other hand, not every immigrant is an enemy of ours. Not every immigrant is trying to do us harm. Not every immigrant is trying to take and not contribute. But not only that, aren't we a country of compassion? And the people will say, we are a country of compassion. Wasn't it us who said, give me your tired, give me your poor, give me your huddled masses yearning to be free? We said that. It is literally written in stone. <laughs> you go to the Statue of Liberty, you go to Lady Liberty, you will see that it is literally written in stone that we are a country of compassion. So the question is, how do we do both? <laughs> how do we do both? How do we establish our borders? How do we keep what we have in safe? And how do we keep the enemy out, but at the same time be a country of compassion? How do we do both? Well, the same way God does, and that is by having a gate. <laughs> By having a gate, by having a door. You see, a wall with no gate is a prison. <laughs> okay? A wall with no gate, that's a prison. Okay? Nobody can come in, but you can't go out either. So a wall with no gate is a prison. But a gate with no wall, well, that's useless. Okay? That, that's foolishness. <laughs> Why, do, why would I go through the gate when I don't have to? Why do I go through the gate when I just go through the other side? And so you don't want a wall with no gate, and you don't want a gate with no wall. What you want is both. <laughs> because Jesus has both. Because God's kingdom has both. God has both a wall and a gate. Do you realize that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is both inclusive and exclusive all at the same time. Did you realize that? Well, the kingdom of God is both inclusive and exclusive all at the same time. Well, how can that be? Well, it is inclusive because the Bible says, whosoever, <laughs> whosoever, let them come whosoever who wills to come in, let them come. So it is inclusive because the invitation goes out to anybody and everybody. Whosoever wills, let them come in. It is inclusive. <laughs> but it is exclusive as well. Because while you can come to God like you are, you cannot come to God like you want. <laughs> Let me say it again, because some of y'all missed it. <laughs> While you can come to God just like you are, sinful and all, with habits and lifestyles and all kinds of issues and hang-ups, however you are, whatever circumstance or situation you are in, 
You can come to God just like you are. You don't have to wait till you get things right. You don't have to wait until you uh, get rid of your bad habits. You don't have to wait till you clean up your life. You don't have to wait for any of that. God will do that. So you can come to God just like you are. However, you cannot come to God just like you want. In other words, you cannot come to God on your own terms. You can't say, well, I, I, I want the Father, but I don't want to go to the Son. Well, you can't come. <laughs> you, you can't say, you can't say, well, I want to go to heaven, but, but I, I don't want to give my life to Jesus. Well, then you can't come. <laughs> You can't say, I want eternal life, but I don't want to die to my sin. Well, you can't come in. I want to follow Jesus, but I don't want to deny myself, pick up my cross to follow him. Well, then you can't come. It is exclusive because God has given a door. He has given a gate, and there is a wall around his kingdom, and you must come through that gate. You must come through that door. No other way. No other name by which we can be saved. God says, you don't want the son, well, you don't get the father. <laughs> you know, that's the gate. <laughs> so while the kingdom of God is inclusive, it includes everybody, whosoever, it is exclusive because you cannot come the way you want. You cannot come on your own terms. You must use the gate, the gate or the door that God has provided, which is Jesus Christ. In Matthew 22, Jesus gives a story, he gives a parable that relates to this. Matthew 22, 12, he gives a story of this master of the house who was having a banquet, a feast, a wedding uh, banquet. And he invited the guest, but the guest didn't want to come. The guests had all kinds of reasons and uh, all kinds of excuses of why they couldn't come. And so the king comes, the master of the house comes, he says, okay, I want y'all to go out to the highways and to the byways. Go out to the streets and to the hedges. Compel them. Tell them, whosoever, let them come. Whosoever, let them come into the banquet so my house may be full. Well, they do that. They go out into the streets and to the hedges, to the highways, to the byways. They give the pronouncement, whosoever, the master, the king, he's having a great banquet. If you want to come, come. And so all these people from the streets and the hedges and the highways and the byways, they come in where the master's house is full. And when the master comes out to see his guests, he notices something. And what he notices, there is somebody there who doesn't have a wedding garment on. <laughs> he, he doesn't have a wedding garment on. He, he doesn't have the proper attire on. And so he goes to this guy in Matthew 22, verse 12, and he says to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? How did you get in here? See, see this guy, he probably came in, snuck in, and kind of sat down, be real quiet, hoping nobody will notice me. No, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb, okay? <laughs> I'm telling you now, okay? He sticks out like a sore thumb because he is the only one who doesn't have the proper attire on. He's the only one that doesn't have the robe of righteousness. He's the only one that doesn't have the wedding garment on. And so the master of the house comes and says, how did you make it in here without a wedding garment? How did you get inside the wall? How did you get inside the kingdom without a wedding garment? And so watch what he says here. It says, and he was speechless. He had no reason, he had no answer, he had no excuse. So watch what the king does. He says, then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot. Take him away and cast him into outer darkness. Outside the wall, beyond the wall, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, wait a minute, I thought you said the kingdom of God was inclusive. And he went to the streets and to the hedges and the highways and the byways, and he said, whosoever, come in. You're exactly right. It was inclusive. But while it was inclusive, it was also exclusive. You had to put on a wedding garment. You had to put on the robe of righteousness. You had to be willing for the master to change you when you came to him before you can enter. 
There is a wall and a gate even with the kingdom of God. And this is how we know it's not, the purposes of a wall is not just practical, but uh, it is uh, a sign, it is uh, symbolic as well. A, a wall doesn't necessarily mean you will be protected. I mean, people got fences now and it doesn't really keep their houses from being robbed. You know, as a matter of fact, when Israel was defeated the first time, they were defeated with a what? With a wall. <laughs> they had the wall. They had the gates, and yet they were still defeated, which lets us know a wall doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be protected. Why? Because God says, unless I watch over you, <laughs> unless I keep you, your city, unless I watch over your house, I don't care what you do. I don't care what you have. <laughs> All that you're doing is in vain, and so... Sometimes a wall is simply symbolic. Sometimes a wall is simply a sign of security, a sign that God is with you to those who are inside the wall as well as to the enemies outside the walls. And the reason why we know that it is symbolic as well as practical is because I don't know if you realize this or not, but even heaven has a wall. Did you know that? <laughs> even heaven has a wall, or the city, the great city that will come from heaven also has a wall. This is our last scripture, Revelation 21. Go with me, if you will, to Revelation 21. We're going to show you that even heaven, or the great city, the holy city from heaven, has a wall as well. In Revelation 21, verse 10, Revelation 21, verse 10, it says, speaking of John and his encounter with this angel, John said, He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And here it is. And also she had a great and high what? Wall. <laughs> the holy city, the city of Jerusalem that is going to come down from heaven, the Bible says is going to have a great and high wall. And it says again with 12 gates. Not a wall with no gate, not a gate with no wall. Has both. <laughs> a gate or a wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And so even heaven or the city that comes from heaven, even it has a wall with gates as well. So the question would be is why? Well, why would the new Jerusalem need a wall? Why would the new Jerusalem need a high wall and gates? Why? I mean, after all, this is after the great white throne judgment. This is after everything evil is thrown into the lake of fire. This is after the destruction of, of, of God's enemies, of Satan, of sin, of death. All of it is thrown into the lake of fire, uh, destroyed there, and so why would heaven need a wall? Why would the holy city, the city of Jerusalem that's coming down from heaven, need a wall? And we know that there is no threat of danger because of verse 25. In Revelation 21, verse 25, it says, Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. Here it is. There shall be no night there. <laughs> so even though it has gates, it's not for function. The gates aren't operational because the gates will never close. You see, with the walls of Jerusalem here on earth, you have a wall and you have gates, and those gates open during the day to conduct business, but then at night, those gates would close to partition, to preserve, and to protect. They would close. Well, in heaven, God says these gates will never close. These gates will never close. Number one, the reason why they'll never close is because there's no night in heaven. There is no night in heaven. All you have is one long day. <laughs> it's 
Do people think in heaven I'm going to be bored? You know, in, in heaven, I mean, I'm going to get out, do the same thing. Go. And there was a, a particular show I got interested in on NBC that came out, uh, and it was about heaven. And that's the best that we can do. <laughs> but it pales in comparison. It's not the same day over and over again like Groundhog's Day. No, think of the best day never ending. Okay, that's, that's what it is. Think of the best day that you could ever have, and it never ends. The sun never goes down because there is no sun. The Bible says the glory of God illuminates all of heaven. <laughs> and he's not going anywhere. He will never set. <laughs> so there is never, ever, ever, any, at any time, night in heaven. That's number one why the gates won't ever have to close. But the other reason why the gates won't have to close is because there's no enemy. There is no enemy. There's no Satan. There's no sin. There, 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 there's no antichrist or false prophet or anything because the Bible says here, and they shall bring in the glory and honor of the nations into it, but there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The only way... <laughs> The only way that you can enter to this wall, the only way that you can enter into this gate is that your name be written in the Lamb's book of life. And if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, you will not be able to enter into this gate. Not do it. So we see then heaven has a wall and the wall has gate, but it's not functional. It's not operational. It's more symbolic. It's not practical it is more of a symbol, and it symbolizes eternal security. Eternal security. You are safe and secure forever. The property of God is partitioned from those outside, preserved from what is outside, and protected from who's on the outside forever. You will never, ever have to worry again. You won't have to set your alarm. <laughs> you won't have to lock the door. You won't have to worry about any of that. <laughs> forever. And all you got to do is look at the wall and the gates to be reminded of that. I am safe in his arms forever. <laughs> forever. So no wonder they are wailing at the wall. <laughs> no wonder no, the Jews in Israel right now wailing at the wall because they are wailing for this to happen. They are willing for, for them to be fully restored in this way. But I don't know about you, but I'm willing for this wall. <laughs> I, I, I may have an opportunity one day in my life to go to Israel, to go to Jerusalem, and, and go to the welling wall, but rather than welling at the wall, I'm willing for the wall. I'm willing <laughs> for the wall of heaven to come. That's what I want to see. And that's what you should want to see as well if you are truly a part of God's property. Because remember, the purpose of the wall is to, to uh, preserve, to protect, and to partition God's property. But if you are not a part of God's property, then this wall is the last thing you want to see. Okay? <laughs> okay? And we're going to close it with this point. But if you are not a part of God's property, this wall is the last thing you will see. Why? Because the only part of it you will ever see is the outside of it. Now, that's why. You say, well, I don't know if that, that's true. Uh, you mean uh, I'm going to get to see the wall of heaven but not partake of it? Well, that wouldn't be so far-fetched from Scripture. You know, I remember one day uh, growing up, you know, I didn't get grounded. Uh, my siblings, we didn't get grounded. That was foreign to us, you know. But I, I live on the uh, white side of town. I have some white friends. They always talk about grounding. I said, what's this grounding thing? You know, we get whoopings at my house. <laughs> I don't know what this grounding is. <laughs> so the next time I got into trouble, I thought, let me try this grounding thing. He said, Mom, instead of whipping me, <laughs> why don't you just ground me? <laughs> so, all right, you get grounded. And so I didn't know this was So I couldn't go outside and play. So what I did was, I went on the porch, and I got to see all of my friends playing around in the street, playing football, playing basketball, playing all the things, and I just got to watch them play. Could, couldn't participate because I was grounded. Could it be, could part of heaven be you see what you will never experience? You, you see what you will never participate in. 
you see what you will never be able to enter into yourself. Now, why I say this is not so far-fetched from Scripture, because you remember Moses? The Bible says God took Moses up on a mountain and showed him the promised land he would never enter. Because you have disobeyed me, because you have uh, didn't do what I said, you didn't trust me, you will not be the person, Moses, to lead my people into the promised land. You will see it, but you will never experience it. You will see it, but you will never enter it to yourself. Then you have the uh, officer of the king. Remember Israel, they were going through that famine. They were eating donkey heads and, and uh, uh, bird droppings and even their young. Elisha comes from the word of God and he says, by this time tomorrow, we shall all eat bread. The king's officer said, no, that's impossible. That is impossible. Even if God were to open up the windows of heaven, we couldn't do that by tomorrow. Elisha said, I tell you this, because you didn't believe, you will see it, but you will taste none of it. <laughs> you won't taste a, a bit of what God is going to do because you didn't believe. You, could, you will see it, but you will never experience it. And even if you go to the story in Luke, the, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, the Bible says when the rich man died, not only did he lift up his eyes in hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Lazarus being comforted in Abraham's bosom. He saw that. He saw what he was missing out on. So could it be part of what will make hell hell is not only the darkness and the pain and the fire and the flames and the loneliness and, and all that in the absence of the presence of God, but for all eternity, you get to see what you could have had. You get to see what you could have entered into, but will never, ever be able to do so. So while we want to end on you asking yourself, do I really belong to Jesus Christ? Am I really a part of God's property? Because this is not something you want to wait and see. You want to wait and find out, well, I just live the best life I can, and hopefully, you know, my good outweighs my bad, and no, you won't make it. You won't make it. You can't be that good. Because you have to be perfect. And you've already failed. You've already messed up. So what Jesus Christ did, he says, let me go be perfect for you. Let me go live righteous, a righteous life for you, and then what I'll do, I'll, I'll make a trade with you. Give me your sin, give me your life, and I will give you my perfection. I will give you my righteousness. And so when you stand before my Father, he won't see your sin. He won't see your imperfection. What he'll see is my blood. What he'll see is my righteousness. And he'll say, enter into the joy of the Lord. But you must make that decision. You must make that decision this day if you will become a part of God's property. That way you can be inside this wall that he has provided and receive every benefit of this wall. To be partitioned from those on the outside, to be preserved, and to be protected. So if you are here today, as we call the band forward, and we uh, ask the prayer team to come up as well, we want to give you an opportunity now to make this decision. If you've come to believe church not believing in Jesus Christ, if you thought you can come from another way and not use the gate or the door that he has provided, but now you know that that's an impossibility and you want to make the decision today, I want to go through the door or the gate that God has provided, which is to believe in Jesus Christ, to repent of my sin, that is to forsake my sin, to turn away from the ways of this world, to fully and wholeheartedly give my life to Jesus Christ, to die to sin, to die to self, to die to the ways of this world, and become alive and made brand new in Jesus Christ. If you have never truly done that, do not leave this place without doing so. Make the decision today to become a part of God's property. You can simply come forward, come to these men and women, say, Pastor was talking about me. I want to be saved today. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to see the inside of heaven's wall, not the outside of heaven's wall. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Make that decision, and the Lord will hear it, and he will bless you with eternal and everlasting life.